you might Let's do a prayer now. Father, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Should we sit here? Okay. They're shy. I might be in the back. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for this time together to talk about your Son, to talk about who you are. May this time bring us closer to your heart, closer to following you, better to carry out your will. We entrust this conversation to you in the hands of our Blessed Mother as we say. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, Pray for us sinners, now and in the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Alright, so a couple of quick things to go over before we get to the actual class. One, is this the last class for the summer? Take a little break. Um, then we come back again in the fall. And we're discussing what we're talking about. And as I was so saying, this thing was still great for you guys. Uh, the bishop last year put out a letter on Jesus. It's being republished now in book form for, for study of the groups. And I was thinking that'd be a good thing for us to look at, especially at the sort of diocese that we do. Does that come to everybody? Do you want to keep them on the Bible? Let it be perceptive? Yes. Okay, great. And that's what we're doing then in the fall. Great. Okay. Well, that was easy. We looked at the King David, um, and recognizing the time, we have to pick and choose what we're going to be talking about, discussing, and looking at. And so, the first thing we'll look at is David is penitent. David is one of those people who, while virtuous in many parts of his life, while holy in many parts of his life, He's also a great sinner. And a great sinner, even after he's chosen by God, picked by God. Father, the Bible story, you see someone who sins greatly, and repents, is forgiven, and then they're, they're holy out of life. David's different. David is much more human, you would say. <laughs> that he starts out very good, and he falls, and he rises, and he falls, and he rises, and he falls. He ends well. You can say is in the church, but there, there does have some very serious sins. Some very serious. And he stands for us then as somebody who knows God's forgiveness very personally, knows God's forgiveness, knows God's healing, knows the holiness. This is the story of David and Bathsheba. It's a story I'm sure we're all familiar with. You find it in the book of Second Samuel, chapter 11. Well, the story goes like this. David has been king. He for seven years. And when Saul dies, he gets found king of Jerusalem as well. And he reigns in Jerusalem as king of both Hebron and Israel and, and Judea for 33 years. Number 33 is significant because of what? Three is old. He has lived for 33 years. Oh, 33 years. Yes. For 33 years, David is king over all of Israel. Now, David gets to the point in his life where he's delayed, uh, he's been all the enemies, he has been wealth and power and influence. So one day, he sent out his men to go on a campaign. He decides not to go live. He wants to rest in his palace. He wants to take some leave. He wants to relax. Remember the soldier who leads the company? The king. The king. Right. This is part of the problem with Saul and David's life. And Saul is a responsible child. It's a David the responsible child. And so David sends his men out to fight. For the first time he leaves them. He's going to relax. And so it is in, in his wealth, in his power, in his. Um, relaxing, he goes to heaven. 
And one day, as he's strolling about on his rooftop at, in the warmth of the evening, he sees a young woman there. And intrigued by her, that she's pretty, he just makes inquiries about her. So Sid Walk is a tempted to look away. Sin two is he was at the event there. Find out she was married or the care, he called her to himself, and he sleeps with She comes to him and says, I'm afraid. And David, rather than repenting, says, Well, okay, I'll figure this out. And he calls for Uriah, who was her husband, who was on a campaign. And right now, Uriah was the only other time. Uriah is a man loyal to him, and Uriah is loyal to them. And David calls before and says, I just want to do that. I just want to Just tell me this. What's going on with that? How does it look? Oh, thanks for the news. Do you want to go home to your life? Relax. And your eyes, I can't do that. That would be a betrayal of, the, of my brother's fighting and the, the battles and killing my king. I'm going to sleep here you know, in the house of the king. All right. Okay, well, that's not he wants to cover up his sin, try to hide his sin. Well, okay, you're right, you're wonderful, stay in the night with me, and here he gets a little drunk. Why did I get drunk with me? As I know what you're right. I said he sleeps in with the man. He's still a source. So even though he's drunk, he's spoiled the day when he's trying to show his, his loyalty to God in day. And David at this point says, well, oh, I can't cover it over. But I will. Find a way to make this look, 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 look okay. And he says to his general, Go send Uriah, this loyal man who's not been predicted, out to the front of the battle line, where the fighting is the most fierce in face. And everybody else then fall back. And then when he falls, let me know. Basically, he's committing work. He's not killing really himself personally, he's ranking for the Uriah to kill. And then, when Uriah is dead, he calls his wife in. I'm so sorry, your husband's died. Let me comfort you. And they take her as a wife. Let's read 2 Samuel chapter 11. The end of that chapter. And people on to chapter 12. There's a whole series of sins, right? It's, it's refusing, it's, it's ignoring his conscience. Not going back and posted, uh, and then finally he isn't committing murder. He's trying to hide his sin. The wife of Uriah had heard that Russell was dying, she mourned for the Lord. Verse 26, chapter 11, Sam chapter 11. Once the morning was over, David had turned one of his house, he became his wife and born his son. Then comes this last line, is very important. The Lord was displeased with what David had done. So the thing is, sometimes people will look at this and they'll, they'll, they'll say, well, David did it, therefore it's okay. Or David is a great saint. Yeah. St. Augustine has a homily on David's fault in his sin. Um, he bases look at David's sin. The book of Proverbs 1 says, don't. Say, I'm going to take David, that will really commit his sin, but his penance is going to take his repentance, his trust for God. The Lord said, Make the prophet to David. And when he came to him, he said, Don't escape me. Remember, the kings had this from the judges, therefore, did they would judge from me. He's reposing a case, and he's acting as though he's the, the real father. At a certain time, there were two men, one rich, the other poor. The rich man had flocks and herds of great numbers. But the poor man had left the office that one would eat land if he had bought it. He nourished her and grew up with him and his children. Shared the little food that he had, drank from his cup, slept in his bosom. She was like a daughter, too. Now the rich man received a visit. He would not take his own flocks, his herds, and try to make the open way there for the company. They took the poor man's ewe lamb and made it build it for his visit. Let me stop here because some commentators will say that, that she would be treated like a prophet. 
The comparison is Bathsheba is just this property of David's stealing. That's not the comparison being made. The comparison being made here, the rich man is jealous of the poor man has. And out of the lust that he has been. So it's not a question of how many other things are considered one. You know, but it's been blessed with all these things rather than receiving that. He is selfish, he is greedy, he's envious. And, he, and that he steals, he farms this poor man for a break. And as you said, it's a culture of shepherds, so of course there's going to be sheep analogies. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. And they were, they were the shepherd. So today we don't get this, right? Oh. When David knows, this is the big deal. Um, David were angry with the man. I said to Nathan, as the Lord of the man has done this, is there reserved to die. Where's that? And all he's done, and this analogy is seen. He deserves that. He's restored the human land for fourfold who's done this and have a pick. Nathan said to David, You're that man. Who does your own case? You just said you deserve death. You made it. Deserve to restore fourfold, and guess what? You can't. How can they restore fourfold? Fourfold, you're right. There's no way. And David, that's what we're talking about, doesn't say, I didn't expect any lambs. I have no lambs. David understands what he's done. Then he continues. The Lord said to the Lord of Israel, I am only two people of Israel. I rescued you from Saul. I gave you your Lord's house and his wife's ground, and you the house of Israel with Judah. If this were not enough for you, I'd be the count of war. Why is the spirit more in need of the son? You've cut down your wife's head with the sword, he murdered. He gave his wife as a rope, and killed him with the sword to get Because of this, you shall die, and everything else shall happen. But I skip down with a longer with flash crystal. Verse 13. And David said to Nathan, I have sinned against him. David sinned. And David thought was covering up all this hiding thing, trying to tell me everything's fine. It keeps getting worse, right? But again, what happened when I sin is you don't really hide the sin in the house. The more we wait, the more it kind of happen, the more we hide, the more we try to cover it over, the worse things get. It's right? so like tell a lie, and also trying to tell a lie, to hide a lie, and then third lie. Is the same things happen with David. He went from being lazy to being adulterer and murder. But David. And he repents very publicly with tears, with mourning, with passion. And David is told at this point, God will spare your life. He will forgive you yourself. There will be a consequence. And the child that you see in adultery is one of God. Now, We kind of think of this with the, what, what's happening? What's the child? Support? Why is the baby dying? What's happening with the baby? You know, this, is, this isn't fair. What, why is this baby punished for sin of death? So it's not a reward for David and the child. It's not a reward? What yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's true, yeah. So, so it's not a reward? And then the Lord, again, thought before that the Old Testament, what you have is a is a system where God's showing us the impossibility of us fixing things for ourselves. Or David showed his sin, told him to lose. David knows that right, even saying a lamb, someone who did that to restore poor people. David can't fix it. They was not the son. So the child is like repayment for the lamb that he like sort of. Um, so, but what's happening is there is a an ending of sin, right? So the a limitation of sin. And if the, if the child, the result of sin, because the child um, 
The child is not about sin. The child is about the sin. But the Lord is allowing the death of the child. The Lord is a will. The Lord never wants that. The Lord is never going to cause it. The Lord allows that. The sake of living things, the sake of being part of the Lord, the sake of the same calling them back to himself. This particular case, what's ha- happening is the sins being limited. It's first of all being very clear that there is no consequence, first of all. The only would David be confirmed the sin, so would everybody else. Right? David's the king. Where David leads, everyone falls. Right? And if it's just, I'm going to say you're sorry, and then I'm in the pool. But then, and so there is consequence. The forgiveness, there's, there's consequences to these things. A limitation. You also have, as well, the, the, the child himself is being spared. Remember, in those cultures, I mean, in, 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 in even until very recently, the child weren't legitimately, there's a stigma there. They're going to, they're, they will carry that socially and publicly. To not be able to recognize this kid, to follow the rest of his life. The child's being spared so. What will happen to the child when the child dies? Where will the child go? Heaven. Child, child, uh, the child is circumcised, the child is claimed by God, and circumcised in the place of the pillar of the Baptist, the Old Testament. The child is going to heaven, the child is fine. It's being spared the conquest of the day of sin, it's being spared the punishment of the fall of David. So there's a limitation of sin because again, the testament we can't heal sin. That's why there was the bad, that's why there was all the good things, is that's why there was the death of testament. Until Christ comes, there's no healing. There's no repayment, there's no restoration of anything we do. When Christ comes, there can be forgiveness and healing, and then some of these things cease. It's all a limitation. So when David hears the child start, just about there, touch on that. Yeah. Please. Um, I thought somebody said that. The, the ch- did the child go to heaven? Was the child baptized or did the child go to limbo? The child will go to heaven. Um, the child has been circumcised. Okay. All right. Which is the equivalent of baptism. Of baptism the Old okay. Testament. All right. right? So, so it's named, claimed by God, has been given the become part of God's family, God's kingdom. Did the people think it, the baby was. Um, David's, or did he give it to Well, everyone knows this one. That's it's it's kind of public, yeah. So at this point, everyone knows that the baby was David, the baby was conceived before Uriah. Um, yeah, so, so yeah, everyone knew. Um, and even if David had took the child differently, the fact is, David had had many sons, many, many wives. Another issue for another discussion. David has many wives, David has many children. And even at all, we do see there is war between David and Son when they pass away. Um, some of David's sons, other of David's sons. Both were laid alive and after his, after his death. Because of fighting the throne. And if this had been only half David's, this wasn't David's losing a wife at the time, this child would have been born and brought As happened in many cases throughout his life. It was a child that was, was laid in that. And marked that and socially, politically, Anyways, uh, the child would be experimental. Um, if circumcision can save the baptism, how did the girls get baptized? So, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> they did it, they said it out. Your mother is here. <laughs> So the thing is, part of being circumcised um, had to do with carrying on the name of Ark in the flesh. It's true. Women were automatically considered part part of that to their parents. Um, in the same way that women did not, not go through a ceremony marking their adulthood and having the nature, the same thing kind of proved that their adoption into God's kingdom. Um, so for a male child, there was a marking of the flesh. And with which Points to Christ, right? Christ is male and his flesh, and his blood, and his blood are all the same. It's the first, so there is, there is a prophecy there. That's why the circumcision marks that. Um, 
So there wasn't exactly the same kind of mark from the flesh of the But it was a, an automatic thing. So they were talking about ceremonies, so lessons and prayers, but the profile was born. It was they were born. Uh, but there was, it was a different emphasis. Is that that bad? Is that good? <laughs> <laughs> If you were Christian. But I mean, in addition to the first blood child, it would be a body in the back of the temple. Right. The presentation. Is there anything you want to add to women or is that? You have a Jewish answer here. <laughs> it's scary talking in front of them. If I'm wrong, they're <laughs> pretty brave in front of your mom. <laughs> <laughs> uh oh. Just find out the opinion, right? <laughs> but yeah. So that's why. Now, when David hears the punishment, David goes to be mortal. He fasts. He doesn't eat. He weeps. He goes to the temple, falls out of faith to the Lord. That's called the fast. And he begs for to spend life in child. The child that comes ill, he loses he feels a little tired of the day of his week. And the child dies. And the servants at first are afraid to say anything to him um, because naturally when someone dies, they want to mourn. They're afraid of, if he was this upset, the child was sick, it's going to happen now that the child is dead. And the day of the year is dead, this is what happened. When he hear the child is dead, he gets up, changes his clothes, shaves, cleans up, eats. And they ask him, what are you doing? You know, when you're so, so upset in the morning, the child was sick. How come now you're not? He says, well, well, the child was alive, but the morning, Frank, God, uh, hoping, hoping he would spare the child. But at this point, he's not going to return to me. I will go to him. They have an indication where the child is. It was a sect to where the child is and had been dead. I will go to him. He will not return to me. And to David, then. It was on, and David and she David, would then have the son Solomon. Yeah. So, with that statement, there's belief in the afterlife at this point with David? Yes. Yes. Um, there's that several of his songs as well. Um, and as I said, there was always belief in the afterlife. What was a belief in the afterlife? Was it ethicist in, in the first five books of, of the scripture? Because it wasn't that it wasn't believed in there, it wasn't that it wasn't um, recognized. Um, yeah, there were certain populations, certain sects that didn't believe. But it wasn't explicit in the first five books, because it was just how the Sadducees could deny it. Um, but it was implicit. It probably was clear that it's there, but it wasn't. So it was a discussion of half of after you die and heaven and everything else. And it was just, but, but it's there. But people get around it because they ignore everything after the first five books. But that, but that was the saddest way of looking at it. But yes, but, but David's time, and some of the song with it, is very clear about it. There's not two lives with heaven and there's not. Do you have a question? Right. So, wouldn't David's firstborn son be the person that should succeed him, not Solomon? Usually, yes. Um, which is, but part of this why there's war, because he has several firstborn sons and several women. <laughs> right? That's probably. But wouldn't it be David's firstborn son, not usually yes. Solomon's firstborn son? Usually, yes, but the Sheba is, is his favorite, and, and Solomon's one chosen by God later on. Okay. Um, and so. During David's lifetime, because there was this war, Nathan the prophet, Bathsheba, and Solomon go to David and say, Choose somebody because there's the civil there, there's already a civil war happening. And one of his sons, Adonisha, was already claiming the kingship. And they say, If, this is, if you want him to be king, let us know. But Bathsheba says, My Lord, you promised that my son would be king. If you're telling the truth, let me know. If you're not, let us know too, so we can know what to do. Because right now, there is Adonisha is gathering men to himself, and when, when he comes, no kill it. What's yeah. a good royal lineage without a succession crisis? Right. Just some movie. And then this goes back to again why, even though it's not stated, you know, black and white, it's very clear when you 
about one man and woman being married as problems. Mm -hmm. Very serious problems. And it's always happened in structure. Let's look at the web then on this another question. But let's look at some lesson, spiritual lesson. The first lesson here then is the danger of being tepid. The danger of tepidity or slothfulness, laziness. At this point, David is very much harshness. He's pursued by the king. He's fought in wars. He's no hunger and thirst. He's, he's no rejection. He's been mocked. He's been trying to kill him. All that time he was fighting. It's like when things get too easy, he drew back and left. When it gets too easy to rely upon God, he said, Look, I got this. Life is good. How do we go? It's one of the reasons why it's worse sometimes, but it allows us to suffer. It allows us to work hard, it allows us to things not be easy for you guys. Because sometimes we fall in the trap of David, whereby when things get too easy, things get too good for us, we stop. Take heads with sin. We stop fighting off evil. And we then fall. David falls because he stops trying to calm down. And he's tempted, he doesn't try away from the temptation. He has the mask. What kind of attempt to do for things? Doesn't turn to God in prayers, doesn't praise God. He takes his ease, he sits around, he says, Yeah, that's it. And when he starts falling, he doesn't get turn to God. Covers up, tends to hide it, covers up, pretends it's not real. It wants to look. There is real danger then of, of the temptation of the pretty amazing. This is why our Lord says to us in the scriptures, if you fall, to fall in danger. This is why sometimes we will not answer our prayers to be well, to have ease, to, to be, 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 be well. Because sometimes if, if you had to grow up, if we had ease, if we, if we were. Everything was right for us. We would suddenly stop praying. We fall into sin. We lose our souls. There's a story of one of the saints, I forget which one it is. I'm not going to remember what I'm uh, I think it was a little bit of a story. Um, one of the saints was blind. And she was a, a one of the sister, a very holy woman. I guess uh, one of the sisters is in Korea. Thank you. <laughs> so, it, one of the companions of St. Bridget, so a 14th century religious sister. Um, but blind, very prayerful. And she goes on a pilgrimage to, to, to Jerusalem to ask for a cure for God. And she goes before our Lord and she prays, and lo and behold, she can see. Rising to the practice. She says, Oh, wait a minute, Lord, I'm sorry, I forgot. It wasn't good for me to, to receive my sight. Take it away. To the blind. Because that blindness kept her reliant upon God, kept her humble, kept her obedient, kept her able to follow the Lord in a much better way. For being, being having a sight would have kept her from being holy and just falling. So there are times the Lord doesn't answer our prayers, lets us suffer, lets us struggle, lets us have difficulties, despair us. And sometimes we fall into great sin if things are too good. Now, again, it doesn't mean you can't pray for things to be good, but it means that just as crosses have their own dangers, despair, giving up, being angry at God, prosperity had danger too. Being puffed up with pride, forgetting that God, that he died at all, praying from God. And that's what David's warning us about. That's what David's warning us about. That's what warning us about. Let us see. You know, sometimes it's good to struggle. Because unfortunately, with original sin, you have this constant battle with us. And it's not one, it's nothing else. And just because you don't have one struggle, you don't have another struggle. And so we have here the danger here, the warning here is the Lord does not always give us what we want, He's trying to give us something. And our sorrows and our pains may be actually great mercies from God, preserving us from greater evils. They have confidence 
supposed to die. We see here as well in the story God's goodness, God's justice, God's holiness, and God's uh, just mercy. Thank you. Holiness because the sin of God. God is a splendid day. A holy, a God of the holy one care of David. He's, he's, he's my favorite. He's my king. That's okay. Who, who's, who's your eye on that? God is a king. Right. Is this an unusual story with people of power, right? People of power that they, they, they say, well, I deserve this, you know, who's going to stop me anyway? I have wrong king. But God is pleased with us, God abuse. God says you reject me by doing this. You deserve death. God is good because he lets David know this. Because he called David back. Because he brings about something good from us. God's merciful because we see him here. God forgives David. David can't repay this. David does not deserve forgiveness. There is nothing that David can do to fix this. Uriah is dead. He's already heard it all over. He can't fix it. But God forgives him. He still demands penance. And he still demands that there is a price. That's just. And this is the way God treats sinners. Sin only the best. Remember, the death of the child horrifies us because we've lost this idea that the death is not the greatest evil in the world. The greatest evil in the world is not death, it's sin. Mortal sin is far, more, is far worse than to die. The child is in heaven. David, that repentance goes to heaven. Sin is far worse than that. Oh. That's not true. <laughs> Either one of them. God Himself intervenes with this. God comes in. God will oppose the Uriah's case. God comes to the prophet and says, Judge this case. God defends your life. God does not forget the testimony. Look at God, God does not just say, that's okay. That's, that's David, he's my boy. He's my king. And if David had repented, they would have died. They would have been cut out. They would have been ceased. They would have been over. Look at the days of evil. It's very clear. They would have died if they had repented. When they saw God, when they saw their death, when they saw their second soul. Because they repent, and sin is forgiven, but there is still a temporal punishment. I'm going to skip down to number four. What is temporal punishment? So why are the punishment after sins have been forgiven? Because if your sins and ailments were born, if you remove the nail, which is the sin, there's still a hole that needs to occur. Good. So even though there's been forgiveness, there's still a hole. What's that? Indebtedness. Indebtedness, yeah. Because there's, there's two problems sin, right? There is a breaking of the relationship, there is what the sin actually does, wounds the, the, the evil, the things that sin breaks. Just because it's been forgiven, it doesn't just mean that there are problems. Right? They'd be forgiven, but, but there's still going to be facts. And justice. justice. And justice, too, yeah, absolutely. You know, there's an end of justice, for restoration, a healing, a fixing of these things. The temporal punishment, this is an example we see very clearly from the scriptures that there is a temporal punishment. This is, this is also in point, this is the purgatory, where people can be forgiven of their sins, but still need purgatory after that, and they have the government of all of this. 
Why? Because it happens, it happens also. This one is an example of that. We see a very good case of scripture where there's forgiveness, but still a debt has to be given. There's still wounds that have to be taken care of. There's still effects that have to be absolved and taken care of as well. So there's a difference between the relationship with God, which is the, the forgiveness of sin, and the wounds of the sin. The effects of sin, the brokenness of sin causes. And so this is something that's what we have to remember as well. And this is why we call the repentance is to come back to God and ask forgiveness and to restore the debt the old God for us. So we're given a penance of confession. That's why we have a penance every Friday, unless it's a solemnity or a feast. That's why this season of life. We need these things. If not here, where is it going to happen? Purgatory. It's a lot more fun here than the purgatory. The goal is to die with nothing, neither, but no, none of this, and none of this. That is the goal. Go say that. But purgatory purifies you, correct? Purgatory purifies you, but because it's passive, it's much less fun. It's just what it is. Yeah. It's purification of real. Yes, please. So, I had to Google it because I couldn't hear everything you said. I Googled it. So, back to, so we're forgiven here on earth, mm -hmm. and then it's cleared up in purgatory, on the book purgatory. Good. So back to that conversation we, I've had with you before, about yes. this whole stain of sin. Yes. Similar? Exactly, that, yes. Another term for it, I want to look at it. This is the official technical term for the stain of sin, wound of sin, dead of sin, same thing. So there's forgiveness, there's is different with saying the debt, the wound, the temporal punishment. So do all mortal sins leave a stain of sin? Yes. Yes. Even though we're forgiven? We yes. Yeah, there's always an effect of that. Now the thing is, that a confession, if we're truly repentant, if we truly do it for a job, if we truly are reformed, might be sufficient to love the mercy of God rid of all of that. If we're less sorry, it might not. Um, but it was always going to be an effect from our sin. Um, the, the, the punishment refers to the way to take care of it, the way to repay the debt. Um, the stain of sin refers to the effect on your soul. But it's the same reality, it's a different emphasis. Um, but yeah, yes. Yeah. The temporal punishment is because it only lasts for a time. Whatever happens, it's over after a while. If it's purgatory, when it's over, it's already happened. If it's here on earth, you do a penance so for a time, whether it's a Friday, it's five of Mary's after confession, but it ends after a time. Eternal punishment after mortal sin is forever. That's hell. So this penance that David did, the public penance and did all that, that would be the temporal punishment that he went through, and now it's when he goes to purgatory. So 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 temporal punishment what would be that plus the death of the child? Um, and not being able to see David's soul, I can't guarantee that David in purgatory wasn't there. Right. There may have been uh, David did a lot of things after this, so they were very good. I messed up a couple times too, but his very good things here is possible that he worked it out after that. Right. Um, okay. But it's possible he did. Uh, but yes, in theory, this worked out. The days of penance, the fasting, the tears, the mourning, right through the But now, after that, talking to God, I can't, I can't give you up here. Now, isn't the, is it the plenary indulgences that take away part of your temporal punishment as well? So, indulgence takes away. So, there's two kinds of indulgence. Everyone knows what indulgence is? Yeah. Okay. There's two kinds of indulgence. There's a partial indulgence. Which takes away part of your temporal punishment, and plenary takes away all of it. Um, and if you try for a plenary and mess up a little bit, we'll call it partial. So, how much takes away to depend upon, you know, yeah, your, your heart is, what you're doing, you know, how selfish you are in the middle of it. Are you attached to other sins? Well, are you attached to other sins, really? And so just because 
You're not attached to sit in and see. They didn't attach to food too much, or attached to being grumpy when I'm tired too much, or, you know. <laughs> and, and so, so maybe I won't get the plenary indulgence, but I'll get the partial indulgence. Which is not the truth. That's so good. And you can get one of these every day. You can get many of these every day. So, go for it. So, so, correct me if I'm wrong, those of you who are Protestants, <laughs> you know, the Protestant as well. But my understanding is that um, they emphasize the goodness of Christ and the healing of Christ, that Christ's blood is so great and wonderful that we have, we have no effect of it. We can't do anything. How can we heal anything? And they're right in that, as far as that goes. Without Christ, our penance does not work, our prayers do not. That's, that's, that's true. But they go up there to say, therefore, Christ's blood is everything. And they forget the fact that we're human beings who are asked by God to As very clear from the scriptures, where there are times where there is forgiveness, where there is no punishment. Um, but basically, they're, they're, over, they're emphasizing Christ's blood and forgiveness and, and greatness to the, to the extent where they destroy human freedom and, and human um, responsibility. Mm. <laughs> that, it depends on the Protestant. It depends on the Protestant. Yeah. And, um, but one of the interesting things is in the last book, I would say it was in we were talking about purgatory. And kind of what we talked about is I can't speak for all Protestant religions, but in the Baptist Church, they spend an inordinate amount of time in Corinthians. <laughs> and so you learn that when you sin, you have to be purified by fire. And um, so kind of what we, we're not sure, but kind of where we kind of said was like, Baptists understand about well, at least that group a pure, that group of Baptists about the purification of for sin. They just didn't name it. And like purgatory is like the name. But but they're still studying the same things in the Bible and they they don't think that if you you know you sin it's like, you know, I love you Jesus, everything's a okay. And, and there are some who do that in the Bible. Yeah. And, and, and there are certain Anglicans who we see very much Right. Well I think another thing that happens of the scandal of abuse. We had itinerant preachers who go around and sell these indulgences. Right. And they didn't really have the authority or the right to do it. Um, and so people got the idea, simply people get the idea, well, like, I just give them a you hundred know, gold coins and I can purge. You got, like you could purchase indulgences. Right. right. And so I think that scandal wow. of abuse led to very well attention people who didn't understand the theology to say, well, okay, that's absurd. And they were right on you know, as far as the abuses went. Yeah. Oh man just misses it. <laughs> yes. As always the human element. Always the human element. And God is the God of the balance. God is the balance. God is the good mercifully cause any. And if he called the apostles of the one of those beautiful and tragic lines in the life of me personally, we get into the Last Supper in John chapter 13, where it says, where Christ knows that everything's going to happen, everything that, 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 that's who he is, what's going on. And he starts the Last Supper, we call it the Apostle's Lord, and wash the feet. No one is going to betray him, no one is, is going to sound for like his own soul, no one is going to be crucified. There's still this, this love, this mercy, this calling, friendship. Um, or he wants them back for himself. He wants them to come to all the stuff that he healed. It's beautiful that you see that I know this. No one's hiding behind their departure. And Christ is like, darn, if only I know that that, that darn Peter was. <laughs> Dude, this is fooling me. Dick, <laughs> nothing else. Nothing else. He still calls to love and still is to himself. 
one more point, then we'll do the segment, we'll move on to the next talk about some more questions. Uh, I'm still going sorry. Uh, and that is the way David repents. David stops hiding his sin. Unlike Saul, David makes no excuses for us. David doesn't say, well, it's true I did that, but it's her fault. You know, David, David doesn't say, yeah, well, you know, if only God had done this. David says, you are right, I said. I do deserve that. I do deserve this to happen. But he trusts God and asks for mercy anyway. He accepts the punishment. He does come with penance above and beyond what he's asked to do. And he prays. He turns to God and trusts the mercy. And the reason why David's forgiven then is because of David's response. When David recognizes that God knows his sin, David is like Peter. When Christ looks at Peter, Peter repents. Peter weeps, Peter grieves. Christian says that Peter would have so much that he would his cheeks for the rest of his life. That's David. David doesn't say, ah, what are you talking about, David? David tried to get David killed. David. David says, you're right. And that's why he's forgiven, because he trusts God, trusts God, loves God. Let's end the section now with the brief look at Psalm 51, which was written after David is, is called, after David is repentant. This is a song that is prayed by the church every Friday. Again, you can spend you know, hours breaking this song up. The piece is a little bit very briefly to see if you can you know, pray repentance. Do you notice that, very, that that title in the parentheses is part of, of the scripture? Psalm of David, Nathan, the Father, came him after the affair with the Shema. Alright, so this is a great theme of notice. Have mercy on me, O God, your goodness, and I'm going to pack him out of my thefts. Wash away my guilt, my sin offense. I know my offense, and there's always before me. Against you alone have I sinned and evil in your sight. There you were just your sentence, blameless in your when you condemned. I was born guilty of sinner, even my conception. And it goes on to uh, trust in God and recognize the Lord again. One of the things we look at from the end is David is the psalmist. David Hawk, yes. He's dead. Cool? Questions? Let's then turn to 2 Samuel 7. So this is David in the temple, David in the kingdom. He came with David to God. When David was settled in his house, the Lord gave him rest and with every side. Then the name of the prophet, here I am, living in the house of Cedar, the ark of God loves the and he answered the king, go to whatever you would mind, the Lord is with you. But that night the Lord spoke to Nathan and said, Go tell my servant David. Thus said the Lord, so you build me a house, you build me a house as well. I have bought the house from the day which I built Israel without the eyes of Egypt, because I'm going about the tent of fall. But my law brings everywhere among Israel, I say, ever on earth, where any of my judges. And that's why I got the house of Cedar. Now then, speak us my servant David, the Lord has this just say. It was I that took you from the pasture, from the care of the flock to the commander at the lizard. I have been to you wherever you went, and I have destroyed our enemies before you. And I will make you famous for the great ones of the earth. I will fix a place for you to listen. I will find you. 
to go on down the course of life. Lord also reveals to you, He will establish a house for you. When your time comes, He rests for at your ancestors, or is up after you at your heir. Swung from your loins, now they kiss him with her. It is He who will the house for my name. Now will make His royal kingdom from forever. I will be a father to Him and to be a son to Him. I will not withdraw my favor from Him as I withdrew from your predecessor Saul. I move my presence. Your house and your kingdom shall stand your forever before me. Your throne shall stand firm forever. Double into look. And the first is David's heart and his love for them. David doesn't get this plan to build a temple because he's told it to. Moses was told to build the temple. Moses was told to build the tabernacle. David simply says, Why is my house nice than God's? And he says, I want to give God the best I have. I want to make this right. It's not, it's not about God's house shouldn't look like this. And because David gives God the best, wants to give God the best, God rewards him several ways. First of all, there's the earthly blessings. Second of all, his kingdom will endure. Third of all, his son will be the Messiah, the Savior of the people of, of Israel. So this is a revelation of the teaching of Christ, of the divinity of Christ, and who Christ is. And David, as clear from the Psalms, knows that what, what's being said. We'll look at some of the Psalms later, some of the prophecies of the Psalms, some of the different David foretell in the Psalms. Not, David doesn't think, oh, that there's going to be you know, some future guy who's going to think about himself. He recognizes that God will come back, will be his son. That's what, why David is shocked. David is delivered one in the house. God was shocked with this beautiful cross. And notice what's being said that if you read there, it's after you die, I write something. When was Solomon born? Before David died? Yeah, yes. Yeah. So Solomon, yeah, of course. Right? It's not Solomon, it's not David's son. Yeah. So, so how can Solomon the one spoken about here? Right? Solomon wanted to go to the temple. But it says, after you die, I'll raise the the son after you build the house. This isn't Solomon, this is Christ. His kingdom will work forever. Right? His throne will never end. Now it's from David's line. So David's being told Israel will last. David's being told he's being established. And the response is because you have done, because you give me this gift, you went above and beyond, you want to give me the best you can. It wasn't the American end, you didn't say, I did everything I required, it, it wasn't wanting more. Because of this, he's given these beautiful promises and beautiful gifts. Now, one of the things here is that he's told, he's told, but you can't build a temple. He says, I recognize this, it will happen. You're not going to be the one doing it because you're a man of blood. He's murdered. This is part of the temple of God. He can't build a temple. It's like Moses couldn't build the promised land. David can't build a temple. He's a man of war. He's a man of blood. He says, Your son will build a temple. And David doesn't say, Well, darn it, that was a nice plan. Shoot. And be done. It's all occupied David's laws. David hires him as artist. David stores of gold and silver. This is one of David's last man of Solomon before he dies. And so when Solomon is ready to do it, he has years and years worth of wood and gold and silver and jewels and everything else. David, even though he can't do it, prepares for it. It's ready. He takes care of it. So, he, so, so even though he's being told by God, I'm going to be you, and say, well, I'll stop me, I'm going to do it. What about it? It's about the gold and the lost. 
even though he's a sinner, even though he's a weak man, even though he had a that. He just says, Lord, who loves where he So he doesn't care if he builds it as long as God's on. He doesn't care if it happens as long as it happens when God is praying. It's a beautiful, incredible thing. And it shows well at Freedom's Church, right? I mean, that, yes, there are times when we know that we do our best. Or we are able to do our best that it's simple. But we can give what we do. We can make things greater than we can anywhere. We always want to give God the best, and God recognizes that as peace for And God is very clear this is something that's poured to our Lord. Not because the Lord's up there full of himself and being puffed up, but because of the fact that it shows his face, reveals his presence, let's understand who he is. Um, other than David does in his lifetime it has to do with the Saul, it has to do with the temple, is David organizes several things. David is the one who begins the singing of the Psalms during the service. David is the one who organized them. Even though they weren't, they weren't written, written by David, David wrote about a third of them that are directly supposed to be his. Uh, but he wants them to write, he organized, he compiled, put together, and he put them into the service of God. He also organized the, the worship of the priests. If you look forward, if you look forward to the book, the Gospel of Luke, where it talks about Zechariah's like turn to serve for the Lord. This order of service was back in the day. They would organize the priests when they go in to serve God, how often they do it, who goes in. That goes back in the day, making the, making the worship of God beautiful, making the services as beautiful as you can. He also organizes the Levites singing, the chanting, the music, the praises. Um, that all goes back to David. Now I'm sure you're a couple of other sure people who are organizing with him. Um, but David is the one who leads the project. David is the one who found that, who has roots to that, which endures even to this day. The singing in the synagogues and, and the chanting in the synagogues, the synagogue, and also the Gregorian chant goes back to David. He's a patron of musician, a patron saint of uh, yeah, musician as a composer. Let's look through a quick briefly then at Swami Na. Now this one is not one of David's songs. <laughs> but I, I put it here as an example of recognition that um, this promise day is recognized. The promise of the Lord I will sing. This, this was written at a time when um, the kingship of, of David looked like the last. Uh, remember during the, the battle of captivity, other places, there were times when David's when the son of David weren't with his kings. When Joseph is, is born, Joseph is the king of Israel. But where, where, where is he, humanly speaking? He's a workman, he's nobody, he's very poor. And he's a king. He's the king of Israel. When Jesus you know, was being preached, he's a poor nobody. He's a king. And so, so there's a question that came about the heart of, of the Jewish people. God has these promises. But it looks like the kingdom is fallen. The, the kings of the son of David are below the throne. How is this possible? How can this be true? How can this be real? And the psalmist said, we know it's real, we know how it's real, I trust God, I'll pray. But let's go on to the song. The promise of the Lord I will seek forever. The fame of loyalty, of truthfulness, of faithfulness, to all the angels. You said my love is established forever, my love for David. My loyalty will stand as long as the heavens. I'll be, I'll be good to David, and David was, was faithful to me. I made a covenant with my children. I have sworn to David my servant. I'll make your dynasty stand forever and stand on your throne from all ages. Heavens, pray your marvelous Lord. You know, it's going to get a little long. Who's like you? You're powerful. And he goes on. Uh, let's look at verse 39. And I get rejected and spurned it and it. 
You're not recovering, but by the time you're done, you don't have the benefits. Where your promises of the Lord, the Lord will be sworn in day. Remember the insults of your servants, and how I bear the slanders of the nations. The enemies of the Lord insult your anointed, they insult by having death. The ends, blessed be the Lord forever. Amen and amen. For the sake of time, I'm not going to go deeply into David's last words, but just so you know, David's last words, according to 2 Timothy chapter 23, uh, is a song. It's a hymn. Where David, in his last breath, sings to God and prays that God is done. Questions on this? Okay. Let's then look at David as a prophet. There are many examples, but we'll look at a couple of them. Where David is very, those that are revealed to, to many things about who the Messiah will be. Let's look at Psalm 110. It's a short song, to be the whole thing, and we'll talk about what it says in a few verses. The Lord says to you, my Lord, take your throne in my right hand, and I make your enemies your footstool. The scepter of your sovereign might, the Lord will stand from Zion. The Lord said, will be your enemies, for his princely power from the day of your birth. The holy day, by the holy day star, to do what I have begotten you. The Lord is sworn will not labor the peace of death, you are a priest forever. And if your right hand is the Lord, who crushes kings of death is great land. The Roman splendor judges nations, crushes hands across the white earth, who drinks the brook of the wayside, and thus swoops high the hand. Now we know this is about the Messiah, because Christ tells us that. Matthew chapter 22, verse 44 to 45. It's uh, famous verse, it's something that all of you are familiar with, I know. I'll start with 41 just to give the context for it. Well, the Pharisees were gathered together, the discussion of them saying, what is your opinion about the Messiah? Who said this? They replied, David. So. He said, Then, how does David, inspired by the Holy Spirit, call the Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at the right hand, and place your enemies under your feet? If David calls the Lord, how can he be his son? No one was able to answer him a word of that day forward, and anyone dare answer him any more questions. So David is prophesying who the Messiah is. And he recognizes the greater authority and kingship of himself. Right? In culture of that time, the oldest male root, right, that ever was. Uh, and so David says, My son is my Lord. I didn't want to make any sense. I didn't mean even, even David respected Jesse. Uh, those that respected his father David. But here David is saying, My son is born. And it says here, they go on here, who son is he? The Lord says, Before the day star, I belong to you, like the dew. So when, before the day starts, so before the stars are created, I begot you. I belong you like the dew. 
God doesn't create do with normal human birth, but the miracle of God simply springs out of his wounds. So there, there is a hint at the Trinity. Right, that, that the son of the dead will spring forth from God without help, nor help the human being. He's the God of the dead, and also a human being. He drinks from the brook. He rules the dead son. He, so this is a prophecy of the incarnation, of the divinity of Christ, of his ruling over nations as king. This little song, this simple word, is the same lot. The promise of the resurrection. Uh, the Holy Son of the day struck. This was seen uh, by the church fathers as being the same. You sit at the right hand, the back of the right hand Christ. So this one song talks about Christ being, being God, Christ becoming a man, Christ becoming the enemies, Christ becoming the right hand of the dead. They are humans. Now, we need all the details. Who knows? You know nothing. No luck. Let's look at Psalm 22. This one is a long song, so we have to kind of jump around this one. But at least the very first verse is something that I know you'll hurt. <coughs> my God, my God, why do you abandon me? We've heard that. We've heard that. Yeah, on the cross. cross, right? So Christ is quoting this, this song, right? And the reason why, why people understand what he's saying is he's speaking in Hebrew, right? the common language. Hebrew is the language of prayer. And he's quoting in Hebrew, and they think he's speaking Aramaic, common tongue. That's why they're not confused. They think he's calling upon Elijah, uh, Eliyahu, Elijah, Eli. Eliyahu, Eli, is my God. They hear Eli and they think Elijah. But he's quoting the song. It's not simply a cry of God saying, me and, uh, uh, no, that, where's God? He's quoting the song. He's saying, guys, look at the song. I'm, I'm living the song. And the song is the song of passion. It talks about, you know, again, what's said. He's sworn by people. I will see a mock. Uh, you have the scripture of the crucifixion in uh, verse 17. Many dogs surround me. This is a strange translation. Uh, it says, Waste of it really is pierced. They pierce your hand like a cat of dogs. They divide the arms among them, they close in the cat's walls. Pierce was a Bishon and circled me. Bishon was, was the area that, that became later on, but the pagan territories around Israel. Which, which the Roman little legions would have drawn a lot of, out of their uh, men, right? recruited the men of the So the Roman legionaries have circled me, I am thirsty, I'm led to death, I have been mocked, I have been pierced with the nails. You sorry, your hand? What you think? No, All right. I'm sorry. I just but, but look how the psalm ends. So slow to this, this great cry of pain and crucifixion, the psalm ends in this. Therefore I will proclaim your name in the assembly. Paul of Israel will know your name. The community that will praise you. You fit forward, give praise. All the individuals give honor to reverence what stands of Israel. For God is not scorned to stand in Israel, this is for right. For that cry out. I will offer praise to the assembly, my bow to the fill for those who fear me. The poor will even have their fill. In other words, everything's okay. What the poor eat because, because of the crucifixion? The Eucharist. This is a proposal of the Eucharist. The poor will eat. Have their fill. We will seek the Lord of praise. More than that, all the ends of the earth will turn to the Lord. Worship the Lord. All times of the nation bow will forth. The kingship belongs to the Lord, the rule of the nations. All who sleep in the earth bow will forth God. The resurrection of the dead. All those who were dead in the earth, my eyes passed across from everybody. I will live for the Lord, my sentence will serve you. The generation will be told of those who have come. 
And so this first half is this, this cry of despair, this cry of pain, this cry of, of, of crucifixion, which leads to resurrection, which leads to salvation, the Eucharist, the healing of mind. So when Christ says this, quotes it, what he's saying is, Right? He's telling everybody, you know, this is, he's a this song. Yes, this is David is crazy. Uh, let's look at um, Psalm 3 real quick. Psalm 16. This is a little shorter. Both of these are talking about the resurrection. I would look pretty short. Uh, so Psalm 3. And many are my foes, Lord, and many are against me. And many say to me, God, I shall save that one. Again, it was said at the cross. But you, Lord, are shield around me, my glory, and keep my head high. And then I cried to the Lord, I was answered from the holy mountain. And then I lay down and slept, Lord, preserved me to rise again, with death and resurrection. And then I feel the thousand of people who raised another side against me. Arise, Lord, save my God, who tired of the jaws of my clothes, break the teeth of the wicked. Safety comes from the Lord, your blessing from your people. So Psalm 16, you have the resurrection. Keep me safe, O Lord, you are taking refuge. I say to the Lord, you are mine. You are my only good. And just take note here, remember it says, Lord, in capital letters, that is God's name, is spoken of. In, in lower level letters, that is the title. Worthless are the false gods of the land, the curse are those who like them. They multiply their sorrows before their gods. I want to pour out sacrifice to them or take them into the palm islands. Lord, you are my Lord, portion of my cup. You may my destiny secure. Because in places were wrecked out for me, for the communities, where they needed my inheritance. I will bless the Lord who counsels me in the night, my heart absorbs me. Keep the Lord always before me, the Lord of my right, which never be shaken. Here is where it talks about the resurrection. Therefore, my heart is glad, my soul rejoices, even my body is well secure. Will not leave, will not abandon my soul from Shayol. The big circle will not see the pit, will show me the pack of life. Bound and join your presence. The life of your right hand forever. Who is at the right hand of God? Jesus. Jesus. The Messiah. It's very clear throughout the Epistle of Scripture. God's right hand is the place of the Messiah, the place of the Savior. Who rises from the dead, who resurrects, who's not abandoned heaven. One more song here. You can just do the Lord's thing again. You can spend hours on this. This is simply an uh, appetite. What was that? So you can spend an entire life in the Psalms. Actually. This is an Remember, no, this came from you. <laughs> Do you remember this? Oh, 
Oh, sure, kind of blurry. And, and you remember we said the tradition was to appear in the form of a dove. Yes. So, so dwelling in the God's house under the wings is under the, the, the cloud of glory. So you have the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit living in the church. Um, the future glory of all nations, the future glory of all things. Um, and the day of the king's life, may his ears may be forever, may remain for forever. I would say remain forever. Again, appetizer, your taste. You could parse this out for hours and hours and hours, but unfortunately, we don't have time. The problem for the anyway. Uh, but there. Uh, but so David's a problem. David is somebody again who God reveals to him who the Messiah is, whose revelation comes from, it's going to happen. David knows who Christ is. David proclaims who Christ is. But his veil is covered up and not understood until after Christ comes. And then the song of our student, all their glory, and their, their beauty, and their fun. We could say, this is what they're really talking about. Questions? Is that why Christ says that he fulfills them? Yeah. He, he is. Yeah, he yeah. is. Correct. Other than two, these songs are also prayed by Christ. And so these songs are with Christ's heart to us. The songs are Christ's own personal prayers. The songs are part of Christ's heart to the Father. This is why the heart of the church is prayer today. They said the during the Mass, uh, they're said by the priests, bishops, the Pope, they're in front of the prayer, the divine office. Uh, the heart of the church is prayer because they're the heart of Christ's prayer. Even today, you know, every the Jew will say the 18 Psalms did. Uh, they're particular this, 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 this is Christ's prayer. So, and, and because they're about Christ, and they're about Christ, and they're Christ, they are Christ's heart and pride of the Father. So, very good. Cool. Uh, a couple questions. Please. Uh, you mentioned that wherever it says um, capital of the Lord, that it refers to the name. Would it be back then when they have used the name? Is it just understood to be that? Yes. Yeah, so, so, this is remember, this is a translation. And, and this, so, this this is a, a convention. If you go to the Hebrew, it will say Yahweh. Um, but the Hebrew tradition going back. A long ways, at least um, seven hundred years before Christ, is whenever it says Yahweh, they would substitute it, and then for the scripture, they would substitute it by saying Adonai. And so, in this translation, they put Adonai there, but they capitalize it so you know it really is, is, is Yahweh. But the actual letters here are Yahweh. The time, the time of Christ, and for seven hundred years before Christ, at least by the return from Babylon. Um, God's name was to read at that time that, that when they were reading the scriptures, and to this day, they will not say out. Uh, they will say out of um, But in the actual Hebrew, if you go to the Hebrew, it won't say out of nine. It will say Yahweh. And no vowels, correct? Original Hebrew has no vowels, yeah. The, the, the vowels were added in 680. By, by the mass by the mass rights. Um, and then also we touched on Zion. Yes. What is Zion? Short answer or long answer. <laughs> <laughs> so Zion is the mountain that the Jerusalem is. So Zion is the mountain. So Jerusalem is built on a mountain top, or it's a hilltop, but it's a, it's a mountain. So this is Mount Zion, also called Mount Moriah. Jerusalem is built here, the temple is built in there. Uh, Mount, and then you have Mount Calvary, which is kind of the hill, the hill with the, this is the Kedron Valley. Can you raise off the scale? Absolutely. <laughs> and you have here Mount Olivet, and then Calvary as well. Um, and so Zion or Moriah refers to the mountain literally, but it came to be, it came to be a euphemism, a title, for Jerusalem and for the, the place where God dwells. Uh, so when it refers to when the Lord dwells in Zion, it's the mountain, but it means it just means Jerusalem, it means the temple, it's just the place where God dwells. So is that on purpose or is it just something that's come about through language? As far as I know, it's something that came about through language. Um, it's just, just one of those things that everyone knows. I mean, is there even purpose in God's eyes? Probably. They tell you what that is, no. Um, but but yes, it, it has to do with, with the mountain. Literally, but refers to the whole area. 
Questions? Trying to pick up the map, that's all. Trying to pick up the map? Your map. Oh, the map. <laughs> It helps me. That you can either help you, that's fine. It helps me. So, so da David is a type of Christ. What is a type or a foreshadowing or a prototype? Is so David a type of Christ with that? So, representative. Representative. Is, um, David is a prophecy that is very me. Oh. Um, that the same way that whenever we try to explain an idea or something to people, whether it's a story or analogy, God uses events and people to go types. And and so David, his own person, explains and prophesies who Christ will be. About every part of August and everything is direct correspondence that there are. His whole life is a, a description of who Christ's life and Christ will be. For example, David was born in Bethlehem, the city of David, the house of bread, where Christ will be born later on. Uh, David, during his youth, is hidden, he's quiet, he's not known, he's not announced. Last is known king. Christ's also hidden life in Nazareth. David slays the Goliath, the weapon that's, that people can have contempt for. It's actually Goliath, the protection. Christ slays the devil, slays death, slays sin with the cross, which is contemptible and spot. David's persecuted by Saul, whom he had whatever kind of goodness for. All he's done is to do good for Saul. He's persecuted by King Saul. Christ is persecuted by his people, by his friends. By his family, all the people who live for Christ's person. David is patiently good to his enemies. Remember, he spares Saul's life, he warns over him, he tries to bring him back. Christ does all of these things for his enemies. Being patient and merciful and kind brings us back to himself. David is both prophet and king. Christ, of course, is the king and the prophet for the Moses. At one point in his life, he didn't talk about for enough time. But David goes to the Kidron Valley in mourning and tears, ascending the Night of Olives, as Christ says later on in the Garden of Seven. David returned in triumph to Jerusalem, as Christ returned in triumph at the resurrection, and David reigns in Jerusalem for 33 years, as Christ reigns on earth for 33 years. So David is this type of Christ. Now, because we have talked about David's sin, the end of David's virtues, and we'll and, and close for the, the summary here. Um, because David is a saint, and can I say David had a speech that he's a saint of church? David's a humble man. David had his soil, David had his sin, he's a humble man. He's not up in his high force, he does take care of people, he does look to God. David, even in his sin, has confidence in God. God does not want us to be sin to despair and distrust him. He wants us to recognize our sin to repent, absolutely. And to trust him and to look to him and to say, Lord, and in your goodness and your mercy, I'll conclude you. David, David is confidence in God. David is a people of piety. He deals with God. He the temple, he organizes worship of God, he longs to give God more and more. David is patient. In his sufferings, his tribulation, Hurt uh, by Saul. He loves his enemies. Even, even, when, even when Saul dies, David mourns. David goes on. David doesn't say, well, Saul deserved that he's a jerk. He'd be kind of hurt. But David takes care of him. David buries him. David loves him. He's a just man, usually. Generous, <laughs> usually. But he also has a sign of repentance. That even though he sinned, he goes back to God, thanks to God, and trusts him. And so David, again, is, is, is this great example to us because he's someone that, again, it doesn't matter how far you go. You're an adulterer, so is David. You're a murderer, so is David. You turn away from God, even though you've all the gifts of God, so is David. You too, like David, can come back. So you, you felt like David, I've like David. 
You sinned against God, and now trust in God and turn to his mercy. And God will treat you like David, treat you like David, and you back to himself to the day. So no sinner need be despair. No sinner need, need, need fear that won't be forgiven. There's nothing that can't hear with one to forgive. God wants to forgive and to heal the for this book. Questions? Yes, sir. No, I, I was raising my hand. All right. Well, this question. Go this way. All right. Not really going to answer anything. I was looking at the bulletin. I almost read it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, did the bulletin. Uh, but I uh, noticed it jumped out at me and uh, halos. Why does some artwork have halos? Is there any significance to that? And then there's pop culture, in the past at least, angels had little metal halos. Yeah, they're very distinct and prevalent for a while. So if you look at scripture, uh, this, uh, for instance, the book of Moses, for example, it's not face to face, it happens to him. He shines. Christ and transfiguration shines. Um, different points in the scripture, the saints are described as blowing in the water. God's holiness. They have God's holiness inside them. And so the halo is a symbol to show that that blowing life of God, the grace of God, like God inside of them. Um, there's three there's three main ones you'll see um, in art. I know, shut up. <laughs> Actually, I'll, I'll give you a bonus for it. I'll give you a bonus for him. <laughs> the main halo you'll see is, is circular, normally around the head. But you'll at times see um, a, a halo around the whole body. There's the they were looping. There's the aureola around the whole body. But normally the halos are over the head. Um, see the vision of God, see the wisdom of the place where you see God. Christ's halo has a cross on it, traditionally. So it's a cross. And there's the word in Greek, I am who am, written that. See, so, so press the cross. There's a, in a couple of, of the older images, we have a bunch of saints. Sometimes you see a picture, a picture with a guy with a square head. That's a guy who's still alive. Normally the, normally the guy who commissioned the ark. <laughs> <laughs> and so in a couple of the emperor, if you don't see it, sort of just stand there. One of the emperor, here's what it was. The one that's in emperors has a mosaic. We're in the middle of everything else, he's there in the square head. In other words, you're holy, but not a saint, so we're going to get a square head. I thought maybe they were just slabs. Slabs <laughs> <laughs> are referred to as blockheads. <laughs> so any saint, I resent that remark. <laughs> Don't make this personal. And then God the Father is going to with the hell of the tray, going back to symbol of the Trinity. Um, and so these are the main. There are, but yeah. Okay. Cool. There's also the shape of the almond. So that normally, the almond halo normally is around the whole body. Right. Uh, so that that's the aureola. So it, so I think what Luke is a classic example of that around the whole body. Yeah. Well, your aura is a little hard to draw. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? <laughs> Why do I suddenly feel the urge to try and shove blocks into this? <laughs> it's a test. <laughs> All right, let's close it for a minute. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We thank you, Heavenly Father, through the mysteries. Bless us during the summer, and let's keep us close to your heart. You understand more clearly who you are. And we learn from the scriptures, the prophets of day, who Christ is from the love of day by day. Do all that we say and do be your glory. Glory be to the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you so much, Lord.